Okay. Okay, we're ready to begin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, here today. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon and thank you for those uh, online. Um, my name is Catherine Yusuf uh, and I'm Professor of Inhuman Geography in the School of Geography uh, and also co-director with Alex and uh, John on the Forum for Decentering the Human. Um, and the title of today's event is, Are There Any Animal Rights? Um, so today's speaker is Dr. John Adenta, or you can pronounce it. Adenitira. Adenitira. Yes, no. uh, and we have a respondent from Macarena Montes uh, Francesi. Um, and I'll be introducing both speakers briefly in a moment, but first just introduce the forum on decentering the human in the context in which this talk takes place. So the forum was established by John and Alex and myself to reflect broadly within the context of the Anthropocene, climate change, non-human life and AI um, on the kind of ongoing central and dominant position of humans in as a kind of figure, a ration, a juridical figure, uh, an epistemic figure, an empirical entity with which kind of uh, understandings of rights, um, belonging, and uh, questions of justice circulated out. So the work of the center examines these tensions between the recognition of, what, of a kind of interdependent world and the ideas um, that animals, plants, and other non-humans are kind of simply positioned often um, as kind of resources for the use of humans uh, and, and then kind of reproductive uh, epistemic forms. So to the, John's talk today addresses whether courts are able to recognize genuine animal rights uh, without uh, instrumentalization. So he's gonna be speaking to this uh, ethic of non-instrumentalization and this contributes to the forum's aim to foster and explore intellectual and policy implications of what we might see as a potential radical shift in questioning anthrop uh, anthropocentrism for thinking about non-humans, such as animals, nature, AI, and divinities. Um, so uh, John will speak today to that question. Um, so just briefly to introduce um, the speaker, John, and a respondent, Macarena, uh, my colleague, John Atatar, is a senior lecturer in the law department here at QNUL. He's associate fellow of the Institute for Humanities and Social Science, and he co-directs the forum on decentering the human, as I said. So he writes on animals in constitutional theory, freedom of consciousness, and freedom of speech. He's author of A General Right to Conscientious Exception, um, with Cambridge in 2020, and forthcoming Animals and the Constitution uh, with Oxford Press, um, maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> and the respondent, uh, I'm uh, very glad to welcome Macchiona Montes Francesi, who is currently at Harvard. Um, she's an attorney with a PhD in law from UPF Barcelona. She's been a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg and a rights research fellow at the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School, where she's currently a visiting fellow. Welcome, Macarena. Uh, she's also a board member of the UPF Center for Animal Ethics, editor of the journal Law, Ethics and Philosophy, and a member of the editorial committee of the Chilean Journal of Animal Law, and treasurer of the Great Eight Project. So uh, as you can see, a, a very fitting uh, respondent to uh, John's work. Um, she has written several articles on non-human animal personhood, animal rights and animal law, and a book entitled Animal Law in Chile. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to John, uh, who's going to speak to the question of, are there any animal rights? Uh, and we'll go straight on at the end to Macarena's response, uh, and then to Q&A. So please, um, if you want to uh, write questions in the chat for Q&A, or you can um, afterwards uh, unmute and um, turn off your camera, turn on your camera and ask the question in person. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. And thank you for the participants that are here. 
Uh, Queen Mary, I know that uh, the people online cannot see, they can only see see me, but I promise there are other people in the room. I'm not just speaking to myself, uh, besides Captain, of course. And so thank you for the uh, for joining us in person and online, it, it's great. Uh, this this talk is the first of uh, talk series <laughs> on fundamental rights for uh, non-humans. We'll have uh, three more talks in this series and they all follow the same format. So I'm, I'm delighted to kick off uh, this series of talks by asking uh, the question that has been on my mind for a few years now, which is what is what are animal rights? How can we distinguish animal rights from other kinds of things? And by animal rights, I mean fundamental rights for animals. What make something a fundamental right and what make uh, something a simple right or a thin right as some of my um, interlocutors um, argue. So I, I want to suggest that there is something that um, scholars, more recent scholars that have been asking this question or have been um, engaging with this question of what are animal rights, they, are, they have been missing. I call these scholars, um, and they are Sastya Struki, Rafael Fazel, who, by the way, is also my co-author on, on the book coming out uh, next year. Um, I, I grouped them together as a new wave of animal rights scholars and they are trying they have been trying to tell us what animal rights are what fundamental rights for animals are uh, and they use they give us a, a series of criteria and i say that they are um too formalistic that we should go back to um, an older generation of scholars like gary francioni and tom reagan that put front and center the idea that fundamental animal rights or animal rights, so-called, uh, protect animals from exploitation. They are things that uh, suggest that animals are not just beings that can be beings that can be exploited. They are not simply means for others, but have their own individual worth, inherent value, and. And so anything that has to qualify as animal right has to be compatible with this ethic, which I call the ethic of non-instrumentalization, which I will talk about in, in a second. So the structure of my talk, which will go uh, on for about 20 minutes, is as follows. I acknowledge that around the world there have been some courts that have purportedly recognized animal rights. I say purportedly because <clears throat> this, uh, whether these rights are genuine rests on whether, in my view, they uh, recognize, among other things, this ethic of non-instrumentalization. So I gesture to some of these courts at the beginning, India, Pakistan, Ecuador, Argentina, and the like. And then I look a little bit at this new wave of scholarship, Rafael Fazel, Sastashtuki, of what they have suggested are animal rights. And I look at the formal, formalistic criteria that they have suggested. I say that um, if we are to employ those formalistic criteria, actually we, we won't have a, a satisfactory distinction between animal welfare laws and animal rights, properly so-called. And so uh, I do that uh, by reference to the ethic of non of non-instrumentalization, which is grounded in the work of Tom Regan and Gary Francion. And then I look at the global efforts by some courts to recognize animal rights. And I use this ethic of non-instrumentalization to, um, to sift genuine recognition of animal rights from non-genuine uh, instances of animal rights. So that's, that's how I proceed. So in 2014, the Indian Supreme Court uh, recognized that the Indian constitution apparently protects the rights to life and security of every species. Uh, similarly, in 2022, which is one of the more, more recent 
um, perpetrated, perpetrated recognition of animal rights, the, the uh, Ecuadorian Constitutional Court also uh, apparently recognized that its constitution protects the right to freedom of Escalita, who is a Chorongo monk. Um, and I, uh, as I will go on to say, there's a big divergence between uh, what the Indian Supreme Court did and what the uh, Ecuadorian Constitutional Court did. And on the one hand, as I will as I will say in a minute, I don't think that the Indian Supreme Court recognized uh, any constitution, any fundamental rights for animals. Uh, whereas maybe there is more of a genuine recognition of fundamental rights for animals in the Ecuadorian constitution. Anyway, so there has been uh, this, this effort, and this effort has been in Ecuador, India, Pakistan, uh, Argentina, and I'm sure uh, other places that I'm forgetting at the moment. So what are animal rights? Now, this question has been tackled uh, recently by <clears throat> both Sastia Stuki, Stuki and Raphael Fazel independently. Uh, Raphael Fazel writing on his own and together with uh, his colleague uh, Sean Butler, both of them based in Cambridge. And these scholars, who, who I have said I, I grouped together as new wave animal rights scholars, want to distinguish animal welfare laws from animal rights. So Stuki provides two criteria. They say that uh, she, she calls animal welfare laws simple rights, simple animal rights, and she calls uh, fundamental animal rights, she calls them um, fundamental animal rights. That's what she calls them. So she says that simple animal rights can be defined as weak legal rights, whose substantive content is of a non-fundamental ancillary character, or the lack normative force due to their high infringibility. In contradistinction, fundamental animal rights are strong legal rights along the lines of human rights that are characterized by the cumulative feature of substantive fundamentality and normative robustness due to their reduced infringibility. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful, but in, 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 in straightforward English, it means that you only have animal rights if two conditions are satisfied. The first one is that the interests that are protected need to be important interests, okay? They have to be substantive and, fun and really important interests like the interest in living, the interest in, in freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And the second thing is that these interests, the way they, are, they have to be protected is that they cannot be easily infringed. Right, you cannot just okay. You have an interest in living, but you know what? I'm just gonna put that to one side. So these are the two criteria. By the way, Raphael Fazel also employed these two criteria and adds a couple, a couple more. But I will talk about it in a second. I don't think that these two criteria are enough to distinguish genuine animal rights from welfare laws. In fact, I think that many welfare laws are characterized by the fact that they protect really important interests and by the fact that they are not easily infringible. Okay, so take section nine of the uh, UK Animal Welfare Act, which protects <clears throat> the five freedoms of animals. So their need for a suitable environment, their need uh, for a suitable diet, their ability to exhibit normal behaviors, uh, their uh, right to sh be sheltered and uh, they are, and protect the need to be protected from pain, suffering, injury, and disease. Now, all of these uh, protections seem to me to cover fundamental interests. So again, to repeat, a suitable environment, a suitable, suitable diet, uh, exhibit normal behavioral patterns, um, housing and the need to be protected from pain, suffering, injury, and disease. I don't think any of these uh, interests would be foreign in a human rights challenge. Okay. In fact, some of them, such as the, uh, the interesting adequate housing, are in fact protected by, say, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. 
So at least the first criteria seems to be uh, satisfied by the Welfare Act. Uh, what about the second? Are they easily infringible? Now, to be sure, there are many circumstances in which animals under the Animal Welfare Act, um, their interests are not well protected. For example, um, they, even under the Welfare Act, their interests can be sacrificed if that doesn't cause them unnecessary suffering. However, there are many instances in which their interests cannot be balanced away. In fact, their interests are absolutely protected when read in, in conjunction with the codes of practice uh, that try to put, uh, so to speak, meat on the bone of the Animal Welfare Act. And so, for example, under the uh, relevant regulations for chickens, there is an absolute duty on uh, chicken holders to feed uh, birds once a day, uh, to provide them fresh drinking water, to make sure that the um, tools that they use to feed birds are not uh, contaminated, etc. So the regulations not only protect the fundamental interest to adequate nutrition, but they do so absolutely. Okay. So this argument is kind of a reductio ad absurdum to show that if we only look at these two criteria, the criteria that, that is given to us by Sasuke, then what we know as the paradigm of animal welfare law, right, counts as a fundamental right. And I'm sure, uh, because I've had conversations with uh, Saskia, that she doesn't think that uh, the animal welfare law uh, does count as a fundamental animal right. Okay. And I think this is because what is missing, uh, I don't want to uh, commit any spoilers, is this ethic of non-instrumentalization. Right? These formalistic criteria are just not enough. And I think uh, Raphael Fazel uh, suffers a bit less, but from similar, um, from a similar, his account so, suffers from a similar deficit. So uh, Fazel uh, uses the language of thin and thick rights. He says that animal fundamental rights for animals are thick rights, whereas welfare laws are thin rights. And he says that uh, thick animal rights are similar to human rights. Okay, they are similar in human rights in, in, in five sets of ways. So he says a, a thick right is complex and made up of a set of Ophelden legal positions, protects individuals' fundamental interests as a high threshold for justifying limitations, is directly enforceable by the individuals or their representatives as a dynamic character, allowing it to enhance its protection over time. So Raphael Fazel incorporates some of Saskia Stuckey's criteria and adds a few more, i.e. Uh, the fact that a thick right is a set of complex or felt in legal positions, that it needs to be directly enforceable by the individual or their representative, and as a dynamic evolves over time. So I think all these criteria are great, they're wonderful. So um, I don't want to say that the criteria that Fazel or even the criteria about, about Saskia Saskia are uh, totally misguided. But I want to say that once we look at the literature that has been provided by an older generation of uh, animal rights scholars, that we can see immediately that there's something missing, right? And what is missing is that, uh, and so I, I won't analyze uh, Fazel's account here too much because I will go over time by too much, but I, I want to say that is also missing this um, this additional criteria, which I think is is a necessity for genuine animal rights. So, what is this criteria? Well, we have to go back to uh, Tom Regan and Gary Francione. So, Tom Regan argued that animals, in contradistinction to Peter Singer, who is a utilitarian, who thought that we uh, that uh, animals need to be protected but only to the extent 
that is utilitarianism calls for the protection. I remember that utilitarianism um, of consequentialism tries to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. So animals, if using them, if there are circumstances that uh, in infringing their interests would actually maximize overall uh, gain, overall pleasure, then they can be sacrificed to the uh, on the altar of the greater good, of the greater good. Yeah, this is utilitarian thinking. It doesn't, of course, only apply to animals, it applies to uh, humans as well, right? So Tom Regan argues that, look, what, contra what distinguishes rights from all sorts of other moral protection is the fact that they carve out a space, they carve out a subject as non-sacrificable to the utilitarian calculus. So individuals that have rights cannot be sacrificed for the greater good. Why? Because they are, are inherently valuable. Okay, they are not just to be used as means to an end for for the benefit of uh, of the, the common good or for the benefit of other individuals, but their own interests are, are valuable for themselves. And he derives that from this notion that animals are subjects of the life, which is a complex set of uh, uh, characteristics. So they must have beliefs, desires, perception, memory, a sense of the future a sense of the uh, an emotional life, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's actually quite a complex set of conditions that animals and non-animals have to meet in order to uh, be characterized as a subject of the life, which can then, which then means that they are not subject to the utilitarian calculus. I have, I have a few concerns with this, but I shall not uh, go on too much. Uh, about this, I think animals, as well as other beings, are morally valuable, intrinsically valuable, to the extent that they are sentient, right? That they val and and that is because by being sentient, you are aware of your own experiences, and you value your own welfare, right? If you value your own welfare, which is a constitutive part of your identity, then you value yourself. If that means that irrespective of the value that you may have for other people, you are, uh, to my own understanding, intrinsically valued because you value yourself. So I think rather than uh, focus on the subjects of a life, we should be focusing on animal sentience, right, as the as the criteria. But nevertheless, I think uh, the, the insights that Tom Regan gives us is that uh, the case for animal rights rests on protecting animals from instrumentalization and rest on recognizing their worth based on their sentience or based on their uh, inherent value. Okay. And of course, uh, Gary Francion views on Tom Regan's uh, theory and makes similar moves, but translates these moves to a quasi legal domain by saying that the what distinguishes animals, animal rights from other kinds of protection is the fact that animals are not to be treated as property, okay? Which is, I think, a similar way of saying that animals should not be instrumentalized. So I think this insight, the fact that animals, because they are inherently bad, are to be protected from instrumentalization, are to be are not to be sacrificed on the utilitarian calculus. I think this is what is missing from the new way of scholars like Saskia Stuckey and Raphael Fazel. And that once we gain this insight and add this insight, then their formalistic criteria are able to distinguish welfare laws from uh, genuine animal rights. Okay, so from this account, this account of non-instrumentalization, or I should say the full is non-mere instrumentalization. So animals sometimes, just like humans, can be means, can be used as means to certain ends, but cannot just be means, cannot be mere means to, to our ends, okay? We still, any kind of 
uh, use of animals and humans has to be consistent with their work, with their self-work. So armed with these criteria of non-instrumentalization, we can distinguish in the next five minutes, genuine instances of animal rights from non-animal, from, from, from non-genuine instances. So in India and in Pakistan, uh, I don't think there are any animal rights. The rationale or one of the rationales that is provided by the courts, both in India and in Pakistan, uh, for animal rights is that animals have certain protections derived from the human rights or from the fundamental constitutional rights of humans. So that infringing uh, the infringing rights of animals would consequently infringe the rights of humans. They derive that by several means, some of which are quite opaque, but they uh, mostly they understand the interrelationship between humanity and other living beings and nature, our codependence, our necessity to live together in an environment that is conducive to mutual benefit. And so if all, that's the reason in India and in Pakistan, if all other species went extinct, the human species, species would not all, will also not be able to uh, survive. And so we protect animals, apparently, on, on the basis of human interests. But this seems to me to not be compatible with the um, ethic of non-instrumentalization because animals are not valued for what, for themselves, but only for what they bring to the human table, right? Sometimes their own corpses they bring to the human table. So the, the protection that is given to animals is not compatible in my view in India and Pakistan uh, with the ethic of non mere instrumentalization. Okay, so what about Ecuador? I think Ecuador uh, recognizes in this in the constitution the rights of nature, and um, I, I'm sure Macarena will speak more about this, so I can be brief. And out of the rights of nature, it derives rights for certain animals. Uh, including all animal species, but in particular, it focuses on wild animals. So wild animals have certain rights which cannot be interfered. So for example, they have a right to not to be domesticated, not for the environment to be safeguarded, etc., etc. And these are constitutional rights grounded in the rights of nature. However, the um, and importantly, the Ecuadorian constitutional courts recognizes the sentience of animals, okay. So already is on a great path to recognize their self-worth, right? The animal dignity, uh, we could put it in another way. But by while it recognizes the worth of animals and the fundamental rights of uh, especially wild animals, it says in the same judgment <clears throat> that domesticated animals can be instrumentalized. They can be eaten, uh, they can be used for entertainment, they can be uh, used for, uh, exper they can be experimented. So there's a clear distinction between wild animals, which have a top tier protection or a higher level of protection, and domesticated animals, which can be instrumentalized. So we could say, and I think that's what we should say conceptually, that they are genuine animal rights, especially for wild animals in the Ecuadorian constitution, but there are no animal rights in, uh, in, in Ecuador for domesticated animals. Uh, the last country that I looked at in the paper was Argentina. And here also we have to uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, in, uh, in the Cecilia judgment, uh, which uh, the, the, ju the judge in that, in that case recognized that uh, Cecilia had a chimpanzee had certain constitutional rights or fundamental rights. Okay. And again, due to the to our sentence, due to the sentence of, of the chimpanzee. So again, this is an instance of genuine animal rights, but problematically, there is an overemphasis on the similarities of chimpanzees with humans. Okay. And this gives us a gives me a, 
some, some kind of concern because it indicates that the protection that is given to Cecilia and to chimpanzees only depends not on their uh, ability to the sentient, but on the similarity that they have to humans. So that other animals that are not so similar uh, would not have the same sense of right. So say a chicken, uh, very different from a chimp, right? Very different, uh, cannot be compared to a human in any, they not even belong to the same kind of uh, genetic species. So that while again, there are certain animal rights and there are genuine instances of animal rights, uh, there are no animal rights for other kinds of people. So to conclude, I have been giving us a, a list of necessary and sufficient criteria for animal rights, but I've only talked about one ingredient, which though I think is key, there cannot be animal rights unless animals are protected from instrumentalization unless animals are protected from being sacrificed on the utilitarian context. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, can we go straight over to you, Macarena? Macarena was there. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, and thank you, John, for sharing your paper with me. I really enjoyed reading it and learning about your ideas on animal rights. I think you make a very interesting point and agree that the instrumentalization of animals is um, very widespread. Um, give me a second. I'll put my timer so I don't go past the time I have. Um, I also think we have very few animal rights cases and even fewer cases, if any, on fundamental animal rights in the line of human rights cases. And so I think it is urgent to have, you know, different strategies to recognize animals as unique individuals and protect their interests. Now I'm going to mention some different things I thought about uh, while reading your paper that might be interesting to discuss. So first, um, I think your argument could be maybe interpreted in two ways. Uh, on the one hand, um, are you defending that these cases on animal rights are positive, but we should also think about other animals not included in these cases? Because if so, this is not uh, controversial. I would think that most people would agree that a judgment which recognizes a chimp uh, as a rights holder and transfers her to a sanctuary is a positive advance for animal rights, but that we still still need to expand these cases to include other animals? Or on the other hand, are you defending some form of leveling down for animals in the sense that no animal should get rights if that doesn't include all non-human animals? So in other words, if all animals aren't recognized as right holders, there should be no animal rights. So we could see some kind of order of preference. So in first place, we can save all animals. And second place, we can save some animals. Or in third place, we can save no animals. I think that it may be counterintuitive to think that not saving any animal is the best option regarding so regarding leveling down, Marxism comes to mind when thinking about individual salvation versus collective salvation. So proletarians saving themselves by succeeding financially doesn't eradicate the proletariat, nor does it help fight capitalism. But I don't see how saving some animals would make things worse for the other animals. Um, or how it could detrimentally affect fighting against the animal exploitation system. On the contrary, I would I would think that saving one or some animals is better for animals in general because I think these few cases are slowly breaking the species bar barrier that separates humans from the other animals and, and in a way fighting human supremacy. So in fact, um, after researching a lot of these animal rights cases, um, I could say that these cases started with chimps, 
then, then expanded to orangutans, to elephants, to cetaceans, to bears, to birds, to other primates. There are cases on dogs, cats, sloths, lions, cougars, jaguars, horses, uh, among others. Now, obviously, uh, we would have to debate if these cases could be called animal rights cases or not. Um, but I believe that it is a matter of time for someone, for example, to bring a habeas corpus on behalf of a cow or a pig. And I would say that arguing that these cases or the news about these cases, for example, when Cecilia or Sandra the orangutan were recognized as non-human persons, th there was a lot of media attention on these cases. But I would think that uh, arguing that this makes makes it worse for animals that are exploited on factory farms or CAFOs would be a, a would require research because uh, um, yeah it's a soci sociological speculation at this moment. Additionally, I would uh, worry that focusing on the whole and not on individual cases can lead us to dismiss the suffering of certain individual animals or certain animals that um, are part of a smaller industry or a smaller activity that isn't as widespread as factory farming. So um, there is extreme suffering living in captivity in zoos or aquariums and keeping animals like monkeys as pets because this involves hunting and poaching, which also produces extreme suffering, not only to the animal poached, but to the mother that was killed to grab the baby monkey and to that whole monkey community as well. I also think that it may be hard right now to ban the industrial use of animals for food, but we may be able to ban the exploitation of orangutans and prostitution or the or their use in entertainment, such as boxing, or using orcas, dolphins, walruses, and seals in SeaWorld for entertainment, or maybe even dismantling the exotic pet trade. So uh, it is true that animal rights cases have limited effects because the judge is constrained to the facts of the case, but these cases can change the life of the animal in question. So Chimp Cecilia had a miserable life in, in, in carcer, in incarceration and solitude in this zoo in Argentina until, until she was transferred to the sanctuary thanks to this judgment. You can just look up the pictures of Cecilia in the zoo to see that she was totally passive and depressed and compare it to the pictures when she arrived to the sanctuary. So should we not celebrate this win and consider it an advance for animal rights? because other animals are still being exploited in other industries? Would we say that there are no human rights because human rights are still violated every day? Would this be like saying that there are no human rights because of the war in Ukraine? So even if there are wars and atrocious violations of human rights happening globally at every moment, we, are, we have strong moral and legal arguments to support human rights and celebrate judicial victories or laws the, that expand rights and protect vulnerable people. So regarding the ethics of non-instrumentalization, does your definition include any kind of instrumentalization? Because at some time, at a moment, you were talking about mere instrumentalization, but then instrumentalization just in broader terms. So I think we would, most people would agree that treating humans and non-humans as mere instruments is wrong. But I think people, there would be more debate when we talk about partial instrumentalization. So people use each other partially all the time. For example, when we have a partner or a child or an animal to avoid loneliness, some could even argue that animal welfare laws are examples of partial instrumentalization because these laws limit what we can do to animals and that this partial instrumentalization is better for animals than mere instrumentalization where there are no limits to how to raise, transport, or slaughter animals. Um, I would wonder if, you're, if this argument could lead us to conclude that not only we do not have any animal rights, but also that we do not have any human rights, no woman's right because women are instrumentalized through sexual objectivity 
objectification, restricted aut autonomy, among others, no children's rights, no minorities' rights, no indigenous people's rights, no migrant rights, because all these groups are instrumentalized. So maybe saying that the law recognizes some animal rights while recognizing how widespread widespread instrumentalization of animals is, is a way to fight instrumentalization. I also wonder whether your argument could be used to oppose passing specific laws targeted to granting certain species rights. And for example, Panama recently passed a law that recognizes marine turtles as subjects of rights. Would this law be an example of instrumentalization because it only considers marine turtles as subjects of rights and so allows the instrumentalization of other animals that aren't marine turtles? There was an attempt to recognize that the pri that primates have fundamental rights in Switzerland too. And the Great Ape Project is working on passing a law for great apes in Spain. But beyond these examples, if laws granting specific species rights passed, would we qualify them as animal rights laws if they don't include other animals that are still being instrumentalized? I don't have the answers to all these questions, so I'm dumping them on you, John. <laughs> no, but I but I don't, but I do think that um these are interesting things to think about. So um, as I mentioned, it's true that we have few animal rights cases, but we can see that the few cases we've had uh, have had positive effects for the animals involved, and I would say for animals in general. So in Cecilia's case, she went from living in a cement cage to a sanctuary, uh, thanks to this judge that granted the habeas corpus. And the interesting thing is that Sometimes we don't look beyond the judgment and we forget about the case after the judgment, but the application of the case, these cases and enforcement is really important um, because this is the part that could really change the animal's life. So in Cecilia's case, um, she was sent to a sanctuary where she is treated as a non-human person and a subject of rights. So this sanctuary where she lives actually enforces the ruling. She has privacy, that sanctuary doesn't accept visitors. She lives with a companion. They won't be separated. She won't use, be used for entertainment or experimentation. She is considered as an autonomous being who can decide about her life, what she eats, where she goes, who she hangs out with, who she wants to interact with, and what she do, does on a daily basis. She is treated as a unique individual with a name and a biography. Uh, and also these few animal race cases we have have been useful for judges worldwide that fear to be the first judge to break the barrier that separates humans from other animals. So judges use these cases these that many times are very weak, but they use them as president to show that, that they're not the first judge that is recognizing animal rights. So that's why Cecilia's and Sandra's cases are cited by the judge in the Marga ha Marga Zoo case in Pakistan or by other Argentine judges in other cases. Or why Estreita's case is cited now in other cases in Ecuador or in other countries. So these judges willing to protect animals who are few judges and need tools to do so, so they use these animal rights cases as well as a few laws they have to develop arguments supporting animal rights. So uh, I was especially interested in your criticism to Cecilia's case in Argentina. And um, you argue that even though she was recognized as a subject of rights with certain fundamental rights, we should disregard this case as, a, as an animal rights case because the judge stated that chimps are similar to humans. So I think we have to distinguish two situations. So on the one hand, stating that we should care for someone because this person looks like us, for example, arguing that a mother should care for her child because the child looks like her wouldn't be a good argument to advance children's rights. So saying that we'll protect chimps simply because they're similar to us isn't a good argument to advance animal rights. But on the other hand, using similar arguments to protect someone is common in ethics and the law there would be no justice without comparison. So when the judge states that chimps are similar to humans, I think she is not uh, using similar, similarity in the first sense, but in the second sense, because she, well, for a formal thing that she is citing the expert report filed from uh, by a member of the Great Ape Project. So that is, this argument goes like this. So as chimps and humans are similar, we share 98.8% we share of our DNA and belong to the same taxonomic family. 
hominids. So the things that we know are particularly terrible for humans are particularly terrible for chimps too, like incarceration, solitude, and separation from their families. So arguments against human incarceration, solitude, separation of families are also applicable to chimps. And Cecilia's characteristics aren't relevant because they are similar to human characteristics. These characteristics she has are relevant because they are linked to certain interests. And so they indicate that, are, that there are things that are particularly bad for her. So for example, the capacity to remember is necessary to miss a loved one. And Cecilia was separated and lost many com different companions during her time at the zoo in Mendoza. So separating Cecilia from her loved ones is especially bad for her. Cecilia also can fear the future and has an immense capacity to learn because she belongs to a species where mothers invest many years in nursing and raising their babies and passing on their culture to them. So a life in solitude and absolute boredom in a cage could be particularly harmful to her. I don't think that highlighting Cecilia's similarity to humans allowed for the continued instrumentalization of sentient animals in Argentina. Judges determine the facts of the case and apply the law to these facts. So they are limited to the case at hand. When Judge Mauricio in Cecilia's case focuses on Cecilia and doesn't refer to animals in factory farms, she is simply resolving the issue at hand, which was a writ of habeas corpus filed on behalf of Chim Cecilia. And I think it's quite interesting to read the part of the ruling where she decides the case. It has six points. And these points are first, she grants the habeas corpus, then she recognizes Cecilia as a non-human subject of rights, then she orders Cecilia's transfer to the great eighth sanctuary in Brazil in less than six months, then she highlights the help she receives from some experts, and then she requests the local legislative power to provide the authority with legal tools to stop the captivity of animals in zoos like elephants, like lions, tigers, bears, among other animals, and then six, what I, which I think is very unique and is that she includes some famous quotes from Buddha, Gandhi and others, which stress the empathy we should have to all animals. So we could think that Judge Mauricio at, actually was empathetic to the suffering of anima, other animals as well, but she was just focusing with the issue at hand, which was deciding if she should grant a habeas corpus to the specific chimpanzee, um, Cecilia. So I think I ran out of time. Um, so yeah, we can keep talking in, in the Q&As. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Macarena. Do, would you like to uh, do a short response before we go to questions? Yeah, a very short response. Thank you, Macarena. I, I've learned a lot uh, from this short response and, and even more, I'm sure I will learn from once, once I'm able to engage further in your in your scholarship, so thank you very much. Um, I have to say, I some some of the accusations you make uh, against my arguments are uh, really well founded, but in, in the previous draft. Uh, so in 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 the very recent draft, uh, I, I I did change some things, and I think that's the draft that um, uh, that the participants have had access to. So in previous drafts, I, I said that we couldn't have animal rights unless um, more animals or, or all animals were not instrumentalized. Uh, and I think Macarena is right that this is, uh, this is an absurd claim, right? That uh, of course, uh, when uh, say uh, black men were granted the right to vote, but other women, but women weren't granted the right to vote, Black men had this human right, and it was a genuine human right to vote. Uh, and the fact that other people didn't have this right, uh, didn't, though it was despicable, though it was uh, a cause for concern, did not uh, vitiate, you know, the progress, uh, the moral progress that was made in that particular instance. So I, I, I take the, I take the, uh, the correction at heart, and in fact, it's something I've already implemented that. Yes, in, in some jurisdictions, uh, like I think in Ecuador, only some animals are granted fundamental rights, like uh, wild animals, while there's an explicit recognition that other animals, especially domesticated animals, can continue be, to be uh, uh, 
instrumentalized. So, yeah, uh, of course, there are genuine animal rights for wild animals, while there are no animal rights for the uh, animals that can be instrumentalized. So my, my argument is very, it's, it's, it's a conceptual one. I, I take it. Um, so it's not meant to uh, be uh, or against um, recognizing certain animal rights, whether it's uh, specific to one animal or to the animal kingdom. It's just as a, it's an argument that if it's valid, leads us to categorize certain cases as genuine animal rights cases and others as none. And of course, we should celebrate whenever an animal uh, uh, is, is being granted a fundamental right. I think, uh, from my perspective, I have a pro-animal rights perspective, uh, even though there are other animals that still are still instrumentalized. Uh, briefly, when uh, my, the ethic of non-instrumentalization used to be much longer, used to be ethic of non-mere instrumentalization. Uh, but uh, Raphael Fazel told me that it was a bit of a mouthful, and so I should I should shorten it, and so that's what I did. Uh, I could now call it the ethic of non instrumentalization, but I make clear that it's an ethic of non mere instrumentalization. That there may be instances in which animals can be instrumentalized, just like uh, uh, the example you gave that uh, mothers or parents or fathers uh they they have children and of course just by uh, becoming parents sometimes they they use their children as a means to to an end right uh they 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 have companionship and they value that and so their 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 parent depends on a certain kind of instrumentalization but that's not just mere instrumentalization because if you read the moral context the ethics of care the responsibility that are taken by the by the parent and the the respect of the parents to the interests and the needs and the rights of the of the children that that's not just mere instrumentalization though there is some kind of instrumentalization. Um, so it, it, in in relations to Cecilia, whether there is an overemphasis on this similarity to uh, between uh, chimps and animals. Uh, I, I think I I take your corrections. I need to re read the uh, judgment more carefully. Yes, if if it's right that other animals are referenced, then I think that calls for a celebration and is right that judges de 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 decide one case at a time, right? So I take your correction that if uh, the case was about one animal in one particular jurisdiction, then the fact that the judge uses this this justice argument, right? That these animals are like are like humans in the relevant respects. If we treat animal uh, humans in this respect, because these animals are like humans in this respect, it's just an argument from justice, for equality, for fairness. Um, so I, I I take I take your point, and I'll I'll make sure that uh, that I I correct the draft uh, accordingly. So thank you very much for your for your contribution. I really appreciate it. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed all. Um like thinking about all these things because I don't really have the answer either. I think <laughs> these are very hard questions. Um, I think when we work in this area, we are also always thinking of how to make things better for animals. Like it's not only interesting from a theoretical point of view, just it's not just an academic interest, you know? Um, when we think about these things, we, we actually are thinking like, is this going to help the animal, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I would really enjoy talking and engaging with with your paper and talking to you about these issues. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Um, so should we uh, go now to some questions? Um, if you're online, maybe you can uh, uh, unmute and uh, un um, well and put your video on to ask a question. Um, or if you're in the room, to just put your hand up and ask a question. Uh, I know we've got some uh, text in the meeting chat. Would people like to actually ask their questions? Uh, or I can read them out. Um, but maybe I'll start off with one, which is uh, a question from a non-lawyer. Um, uh, but from a geographer, which is kind of touches, I think, on both of your um, 
both of your kind of approaches is, is the kind of speculative approach. So is there a way that we can kind of think about a redescription of the human, non-human relation that is not kind of codependent on a set of kind of utilization? So is there a kind of a positive way to think about that kind of codependency? And I think Macaron, you talked to this um, a bit. And then that's the sort of speculative question. And then the sort of specific question is, is there a way to think through the lens of non-human labor as a way to think about kind of um, utilization again in a kind of positive way to um, protect forms of labor in the same way that we protect forms of labor, human labor uh, within um, systems. So if we think about all the kinds of non-human labor, um, whether it's sort of weaponization of animals in war or kind of through emotional support or all sorts of other ways to think about labor as a lens within kind of uh, non-human rights. So Macaron, do you want to go from first or? Um, whatever you want, John, if, please, if you want please, to start. I've spoken a lot. <laughs> um, well, I think it's the first question is um it's very very hard to move away from the, the way we use animals because it's so widespread in society that that um when we're talking about our legal systems it's it's kind of we're working within that instrumentalization and the overlap between philosophy and the law isn't perfect so I think that's why we have so many contradictions in the law versus when we read about theories about animal rights the law is much more complicated because well there's more there's political things coming into it economic things social things even cultural things so even when we are reading about different animal rights cases from different countries and seeing the arguments, we also have to consider, yeah, the local culture, the legal system, and many other aspects. Moving away from instrumentalization is like, maybe one of the things that is coming mainstream now is this tendency to recognize the rights of nature and recognizing nature and elements of nature as entities or beings that have inherent worth beyond the worth that humans get from nature and animals and other non-living beings and including in this sense indigenous worldviews on the relations with nature um but i think there's still a lot of research to do in this area this is the area that i am working on currently in at harvard with professor kristen stilt that is kind of using the rights of nature to expand animal rights and regarding labor, I think that this is a controversial also topic because many ways in which we use non-human labor are completely ways of ex are exploitative to towards animals, using using animals in war, using animals in the police forces, using animals even as companions is still a use of animals. I know there are scholars that work on recognizing on, on this non-human labor and saying that if we're going to use animals, we should recognize vacation, uh, hours, uh, retirement, um, our break times and other forms um, that human workers have. Um, but I'm not sure if we should even be using these animals as labor to start with. But it's kind of like the debate between animal welfare and animal rights. Is it better to have animal welfare? Or does this uh, make us exploit animals more? So if we recognize animals as non-human labor and regulate this, would this make it okay to use them as labor? Or would, would this expand the their labor? So I'm sorry, I think I didn't answer any of your questions, <laughs> but I think there are things that we have to seriously, seriously think about when we talk about these, these topics. 
on on non-human labor on animal labor um uh, i think we need to acknowledge that animals are ready labor and we benefit from their work um eat uh so for example pollination done by bees and uh, very important uh, in fact we are um, alarmed because of bees are uh, getting extinct and it's labor that they they uh, they do for themselves by themselves without necessarily human guidance though of course humans are exploiting uh, uh, those as well uh, at, at the vast scale so because animals are already we are already benefiting from animal labor I think that this is uh, this may be an alternative ethical um, pathway to think of our responsibilities towards animals animals. Um, I don't think it, it can substitute the um, the ethic um, that takes animals to be in, inherently valuable. Uh, it can be a complementary ethic. Hey, it's just like a give and take. This person is doing a lot for me. I should I have certain responsibilities for this person. So I think as a complementary ethical stance, uh, of course, but I, I wouldn't want that to be um, the main focus of our ethical uh, landscape towards animals. There's a question in the chat, if you want me to read it. Yes, yes great. It says, are we assuming that animal rights should be recognized to all non-human beings? Do elephants and primates have the same moral status as cockroaches and bacteria? Uh, so in terms of... Uh, uh, non-human beings, there are plenty, right? Plenty of different non-human beings. And I have I have been focusing so far on uh, the rights of sentient beings because I think the moral case for including sentient beings is, uh, is more straightforward uh, because, as I said, I think that a sentient being is able to value their own well-being or at least aspects of their own well-being and so because well-being is constituting at least partially of their identity, then they are uh, they value themselves. Um, so nonsense in beings, of course, uh, this raises all sorts of, of tricky issues, whether this focus on sentience is a, is a bit too discriminatory. I, I tend to think it's not. Uh, I know that Macarena uh, indicated certain uh, traditional worldviews they look at humans, uh, what people call indigenous worldviews, but I, I, I don't like the label. Uh, what And on, under these worldviews, more beings than just sentient beings could be included for fundamental rights protection. I, 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 I'm, I'm very much still committed to the sentient, uh, to the well-being of sentient view, uh, beings, but I acknowledge that maybe there are other um, there are other ethical uh, frameworks, which would include uh, some some other anim non animals. Uh, by the way, we we have a series of talks on in insect rights rights for insects. Uh, not next week, but the in two weeks time, I think. And and of course, Patricia is is already joined. Is is part of this talk, and she she's going to be talking about rights of nature next week. So yeah. I would add that I, I agree with John when we're talking about these, we're talking about sentient animals. Um, the thing with sentience that it's a scientific term, so it could broaden. There's still a lot we don't know about some beings if they are sentient or no. So that's why in a lot of cases we have to act uh, according to a precautionary principle. Um, so, but I also think that within the spectrum of sentient beings, there are very different animals that uh, belong to this category. And so these differences are very important because they will indicate um, how we can better protect these animals and ensure their interests. So sometimes I think that these very general laws recognizing animals' uh, rights obviously 
can be uh, beneficial and have positive co consequences and certain things that we can recognize are uh, probably applicable to sentient beings like uh, to avoid their suffering uh, among other other things but i also think that uh, going into a specific characteristics of the animals that belong to a certain species or or group will give us information about more specific interests that we need to protect so for an animal to to thrive or flourish I think we need to ensure more than just avoiding their suffering, but also uh, recognizing other things that mm, are relevant to them. For example, relationships, um, social bonds, um, um, for example, boredom can be very, very, very detrimental to, to, marry, to many animals. It can cause physical and psychological problems that are very serious. And there's a lot of research on this by Lori Marino, who's a neuroscientist focused on cetaceans. So I think that it is important to focus on the whole, but also on the needs of, of smaller groups of animals to actually determine what they what, uh, what their interests are and how we can protect these interests. Thank you. Um, can I ask Patricia to uh, unmute and ask her a question? Thanks. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you uh, hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Okay, great. great. Thank you. I just wanted to um, maybe add one aspect to what Macarena just said. I think it's a, uh, making the, the properties and the interests very concrete and specifying uh, these properties is not only important to know what what the protection needs look like, but it it is crucial when we come to um, balancing situation, when we have conflicts. Uh, imagine a forest being confronted with invasive insect species, and we have to balance what what is more important, the interest of the forest by contrast to the interest of this the, the insect, then we somehow have to know why we decided to actually grant rights to a forest or insects. And then we have to explain for what properties we did so. I think this balancing and conflict situation makes it in inevitable to specify protection needs by means of specifying properties of the different subject. But this is really something I will also address next week. <laughs> so it's a spoiler, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Thank you, but maybe Macarena, you have, uh, or also John, you have something to uh, in mind uh, on on this balancing conflict situation and the question of can we compare cockroaches to sentient beings? Like I don't know, uh, yeah. Although cockroaches are also probably sentient beings, but can we um, compare bacteria uh, with um, the needs of of a dog? Um, so in this situation of conflict. Macarena? Um, so I don't have an answer to this. I think it's a thing that we will have to go, we would have to address case to case as happens with conflicting rights is a matter of seeing in the specific case. I think that when these conflicts between nature and animals appear, it's comp it, it will be kind of valuing on the scale if, for example, suffering weighs more than than the ecological balance of, for example, a specific ecosystem, what what is more important for us? Also, I think sometimes this debate is can be simplified because we say like it's a forest against the invasive animal, but the forest is also the habitat of other sentient animals, so it is more complicated than it sounds. It's not like, or the forest or the invasive animal. It can be the forest and many other relationships that are involved. I think maybe this way of thinking can, comes from our, this way we have of seeing nature, humans, animals, like as these different separate categories that do not, that are not linked in any way. And I think precisely the difficulty is that all these relationships actually interconnect 
and something I do influences the the influences nature or elements of nature, but also influences animals. So what an invasive animal does, it probably affects other animals, affects nature, but maybe also positively may positively affect some animals and affect neg negatively affect other animals. So it's it's a very hard thing. I imagine, I think when these hard uh, cases come up, there must be, if it comes up in court, I think judges really need the help of experts to solve these cases because judges do not have these scientific concepts at hand. Uh, I think scientists in this sense are very important in these matters not uh, to determine all the interests that are coming into place when, when a, such a situation happens. I don't know, John, John, if you want to add something else. Uh, no, not at all, because this is, uh, is going to be the focus of uh, the chapter that I have to write for my book. So I don't want <laughs> any spoilers. And more importantly, I haven't thought through the issues uh, thoroughly enough. So uh, there's that. So I wouldn't add anything on this. So we have a question here in the room, and then we'll take your question, Jay. Um, I hope you can. You, can you hear me? Okay, Macarena. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, she can hear. Forgive me for asking a less um academic question. I'm curious if you only could use the five freedoms and let's say current laws, could you use the five freedoms to argue that? Um, factory farming is not meeting the five freedoms for animals. Yeah, the five freedoms, uh, they are actually very important, ethically speaking. But, uh, and, and if that was all that we had, and there were no other qualifications, um, perhaps your argument could, could succeed. Uh, the, the argument that uh, factory farms do not meet five freedoms under any kind of circumstance. Uh, and so because they don't meet the five freedoms, then um, then uh, factory farms should be illegal. And I think some, some scholars are trying to make this kind of argument or are exploring the plausibility of this argument. I think the, the main uh, barrier is that all of the freedoms, many of the freedoms, not all, but many of the freedoms are qualified, especially in the Welfare Act, by this uh, uh, unnecessary suffering, so that the, the interests of animals can uh, be balanced up, traded up, if uh, this is necessary. And necessity is interpreted in a wide sense, just like in, in India, to include any kind of uh, not any kind of, but uh, a large measure of convenience, right? But that doesn't undermine the argument I made in the paper that <clears throat> even though many of these freedoms are sacrificed, actually some of them are still protected and are protected absolutely. But factory farms, the, the, main, the main issue with factory farming is that it causes great suffering, pain, um, it uh, interferes with the freedom of animals, um, and it uh, kills them, uh, more importantly. So, uh, and this this is uh, the interference with the right to life, the freedom uh, is, is just not protected at all. Uh, so I don't think the five freedoms alone are sufficient because of the qualification that uh, necessary suffering brings. To the, to the table. Uh, can I add something? So, um, as John said, that, that qualification comes not from the animal welfare science, but it comes from lawmakers and policymakers to allow these activities to keep going. Because animal welfare is a science, you know, it's a science that is focused on studying um, and how. Uh, we can ensure that animals cope with their environment. So even in a world with no factory farms, no industry exploiting animals, and we imagine all the cows and chicken go to sanctuaries, animal welfare would still be an important area to, to how we should uh, help these animals cope in this environment. So it doesn't make an animal welfare as a science doesn't make a claim on 
if we should use animals or not. The thing, the problem is that we use animal welfare science. If we put it in the law and we put qualification that, as John mentioned, so we can keep exploiting animals and using them and just establish certain minimum minimum requirements to avoid unnecessary harm. Uh, can we? Get, is Joe still there? Do you want to ask your question? <laughs> yes. Uh, hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Joe. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks very much, John, for that that really um, interesting and thought-provoking paper, and also, uh, Macarena, for your response to it. Um, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed the fact that you're, you're critiquing a view that's becoming increasingly predominant and one that I find quite convincing, so it's always nice to have, you know, those sorts of views challenged. But I wanted to ask you a question about the nature of your critique of the likes of, of Saskia and Raphael's distinction. Um, because it seems to me that you were kind of rooting what you think uh, a sort of a legal animal rights framework should be based on, on this idea of non-instrumentalization. In other words, um, the fact that individuals can't have their interests overridden merely on the basis of some countervailing consideration. Um, but what strikes me is that, of course, this is a part of both Raphael and Saskia's theories, right? They say that um, to for a right to constitute a fundamental right, it has to um, have a high degree of, of, of non-overridability or non-infringement or something like that, right? So there's this there's the same counter utilitarian element in, in their theories. And I'm wondering if the distinction between theirs and yours is that they kind of look at individual fundamental rights in a sort of discrete way, whereas you think they have to be linked to some overall status, right? So that um, it doesn't make sense to say that animals have a fundamental right to food if they don't also have a fundamental right to life, or you can't give a, uh, a it doesn't make sense that animals have a fundamental right to habeas corpus if they're not viewed as the type of beings whose interests can never be overridden merely for kind of uh, consequentialist or utilitarian considerations. Um, and I'm wondering, is an implication, if that's correct, is an implication of your view that fundamental rights for animals can't be won incrementally. So the, the Swiss primates initiative to extend rights to life and bodily and mental integrity to animals doesn't count because there might be some other instances outside of the purview of those rights where these primates could have their, their, their other interests overridden. Um, so uh, is that an implication of your view that, that, that um, changing the, the status of, of animals in law to, I don't know, beings who can't be instrumentalized ever. Is that a sort of necessary prerequisite for them having any fundamental rights at all? Uh, thanks very much. That's, that's a super insightful question, Joe, uh, as always. And, and it's always a pleasure to interact with you. And I wish you were in the room as well. Uh, the, the question is, is really well put. And to repeat to the audience is whether my view that animals should not be instrumentalized and that counts, that is a necessary, is a necessary condition for genuine animal rights, whether it's incompatible with incrementalism and uh, with the view that, you know, that we, we discover new ways not to instrumentalize animals uh, just like humans. Uh, and I want to, I want to say that I haven't, I haven't thought about that, so my gut reaction would be that um, what constitutes respect for the inherent worth of an individual from an epistemic point of view would, would be something that accumulates over time, that uh, arises over time. Uh, I think what's definitely missing in, in Saskia and Raphael's work is that this, uh, this notion is, first of all, not spelled out. And so may, we may read it into it, yes, into this high threshold uh, of non-infringibility, but I, I think it needs to be explicit, right? So even if we are charitable and we read this condition into it, then at least my, my work uh, invites them to, to be explicit about it. Um, I think that incrementalism is not incompatible with 
this idea of non-instrumentalization. Just because like in the human rights context, we realize that there are different ways, right, to respect the inherent value of a person. And that in, in the past, we may have instrumentalized people or denied aspects of their dignity, of their worth, say, um, uh, the recognition of same-sex marriage has only been a recent development in international and domestic law, right? Doesn't mean that because people prior to uh, the recognition of same-sex marriage uh, didn't have any fundamental rights, right? Now, we recognize that over time, we need to respect that non-instrumentalizing someone or recognizing them as a subject of, of rights that are valuable will require us to move uh, to expand the ways in which we treat them. And I think this is actually in, 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 in Raphael's fifth criteria, right? That we need the rights are the kind of thing that keep expanding. So I definitely don't want to throw away Raphael's or Saskia's Tuti's criteria. And I, I and I but I, I think Joe that your um, your your challenge um helps me right to to um to broaden my horizon. But I don't think this incrementalism is incompatible with um uh, with with my theory. Thank you, Joe. I wonder whether we can uh, have a look through the questions that were raised uh, in the comments, and then perhaps we can go from. Uh, we have a question here from. Uh, would you like to ask you ask your question, yeah, uh, Javier? Uh, Does that mean no? Okay. Uh, well, you, if you've got a question, you can ask it. Well, yeah, I it was, with. yeah, I asked it at first time for John actually, but I have a bit more added, but I'll try to keep it very small. Uh, so, as you were speaking, John, it was a great speech, by the way. Thank you. And uh, during the speech, maybe I missed something uh, in the meantime, but I heard something like animals cannot be instrumentalized, but also can be means to an end at the same time. I couldn't understand how that could happen because in my view, it's in conflict. Right, yeah, I think you just missed the, uh, the qualification oh. I was making. Yeah, so uh, animals, just like humans, sometimes uh, can be a means to an end, can be used as a means to an end, just like a parent uh, sometimes hangs out with, with their child and they use that companionship as a means to the end of not being alone, right? But of course, that doesn't mean that the uh, parent is disrespecting the inherent worth of the of the child. It just means that they are not simply using that child as a means to their end, right? So for example, they look after the child, they respect the rights of the child. Uh, uh, they have they take particular responsibilities to, towards the child. So in some circumstances, we can use other people, including animals, as means to certain ends. But when we do that, we have to do so in a way that respects their own dignity. So we cannot use them as mere means, like uh, Kant would say, or Kantians would say, but we have to use them in a way uh, that respects their status. So I think there, there's no conflict. In um... So on that point, um, so I am within the area of critical animal studies. I'm not I'm now doing my PhD, actually. And so these are very much within my research. That's why I'm very excited. Uh, and I also had the chance to listen to Macarena before during, I guess, a NYU speech. And so um, I'm from Turkey. And recently, we had this earthquake. And during the earthquake, um, dogs are used as they are used generally. And a dog helped many humans, of course, but in the end, this dog died because of this. And so in this case, I use this example in my thesis as well, because I think there is a problem there. So we could say this is animal labor. But do we know if this dog who died because of humans really knew the risks of doing that? So it is quite a tricky way of using animals in that case. For example, I would say I have a dog at home and I am her human, I am taking care of her, I am not harming her in any way. Maybe she's in a certain way confined into a house, but of course you know how she's like reacting, etc. That's sort of private matters that you can make sure 
that the animal is happy, not being used, etc. But in these sort of cases, when animals are used, and like uh, I am actually referring to what Makarena just said in her speech, when we say we are, uh, for example, like the dog is retired, I don't think that would make sense because I mean, to the dog, that is not retirement. The dog probably is not aware of the situation at all, just being trained in that way. So I, I would argue that it is a sort of exploitation just for uh, the humans. And a second thing, I am very curious about this, and maybe Makayana knows more about this because I am not a law person at all. I am just interested. I have to know a bit. And so recently there has been a case that... Um, I can't pronounce his last name, but Wayne Sung, uh, he was found guilty of felony conspiracy and he had like two misdemeanor charges because he was actually rescuing animals from a farm. And so I would, I am very much pro like uh, evolutionist veganism. I am following Franz Jon in that sense. But I mean, when people are trying to save these animals, they are just, yeah, they're facing charges. Uh, when we are trying to like uh, expand animal rights to cows and uh, yeah, other animals, we have these sort of issues. So uh, I am a bit confused, like how are we going to move on from this? And also in Canada recently, there has been a case that uh, now we cannot really take pictures of animals who are in the factory farms and in bad states. It is now becoming a sort of, uh, we have a sort of ban coming up on that. So sorry, I dumped a lot, but <laughs> this is the, the kind of thing that I've been to. Okay, so uh, thank you for that question. Maybe I'll just take the uh, question from the chat as well, and then we'll wrap up yeah. um, as we're running out of time. So the question in the chat is, what do the speakers think of Saskia Stucky's view of animals right, animal rights law as a kind of transitional justice? Um, so could I ask you just for some final comments, Vakarina and John? Um, before we wrap up um, to either of those two questions. Uh, Macarena, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, I think that question on transitional justice, yeah, we, we could view uh, those positions as advancing towards more uh, of an extended animal liberation. Or as Joe was mentioning, it's a, it's a way of thinking of incrementing um, our protection toward of animals, our animal rights. It's ad advancing to this state of animal liberation. So I think you, you could interpret that, but I don't know if Saskia has written about transitional justice related to her theory. Um, in terms of Saskia's uh work, I think actually she's not talking about animal rights law in the big animal rights sense, fundamental rights sense, but she's talking about animal welfare laws as a form of transitional justice. Um, I don't know well enough to uh, to comment on that. As, as well, as I, I, I don't think actually that the, the injustices that uh, animal activists are facing, um, they're just not within my area of expertise, so I'm not able to comment. But we we did have a, make a few comments here and there about animal labor, and I, I'm sympathetic to the view that there may be some animals, given that they don't have the same cognitive abilities to comprehend that they are being used as as labor, then maybe we shouldn't be uh, using them at all. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about this uh, enough. But in any way, thank you to you, and thank you to the the rest of. The attendees whose question uh, we unfortunately not be able to cover. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us online too. Okay, thank, thank you, you guys. And please do look at the next event that has been posted in the chat. And sorry that we couldn't address all the questions of everyone. Very grateful to you, Macarena, for your intervention. And thank you to the people in the room. And thank you to the people online. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you, John. Bye. Bye.